Well, as I mentioned before, uh, in other lectures, this lecture is um, being video recorded in a podcast and will be available uh, through our iTunes channel and also our, our Kennedy Center website. It is our great pleasure to welcome Professor Oleon, who is currently a visiting lecturer in the Department of Sociology at the University of Chicago. He's on leave from the Department of Social Sciences of the École Normale Supérieure in Paris. Uh, Professor Oleon's uh, publications include uh, a number of, of publications in French, which I will not uh, do the disservice of reading, um, because it would, be, it would be terrible, and French is a beautiful language. Um, he has received master's degrees in economics, sociology, and political science from the University of uh, University of Paris one Pantheon Sorbonne and is a PhD candidate at EHESS in Paris, uh, affiliated to the Center Maurice Halbwash. Um, he uh, essentially connected with us in a number of places, but I understand the first connection was in Brussels at the European uh, Union where Professor Cole Durham and uh, um, Dr. Jim Stevens was doing some work and research. Uh, he's uh, had a number of, of kind of whirlwind meetings here on campus with political science department, uh, the French department, uh, European studies, and uh, the Center for Law and Religion Studies. Uh, we've uh, had the chance to do a quick tour of Utah, and uh, I understand this is his, his, uh, f his trip. This trip is the furthest west in the United States that he has made it, so I think there's a little bit further to go, uh, but we're very glad that uh, he's made time uh, in his schedule to come and uh, visit us here at Brigham Young University. Uh, the title of his topic, uh, of his lecture again, is The Invisible Crowd, Lobbying the Media at International Summits. Please uh, welcome Etienne Olian. All right. Well, thank you all for, uh, for being here. Uh, I'd like to thank, uh, obviously, uh, uh, Corey and uh, your name, young man. Josh, for your uh, for your um, uh, introductions. Uh, thanks, obviously, to the David Kennedy Center for in, for having me here. Thank you to my friend Rob, Rod, who helped me putting out actually the PowerPoint because I have some technological problems. And uh, thank you also to all of you guys for being here. I'm really glad to share uh, with you some of uh, the findings from this research I conducted a while ago. But I would be even happier to discuss it with you. So we'll try to leave some time for the Q and A. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, taken from a research I conducted in 2006-2007. Uh, uh, at that time, I was interested in the transformations of uh, the nonprofit sector, and especially in the uh, internationalization or globalization that, um, and the consequences thereof. Uh, I was in particular looking for uh, the, profession, the professionalization of the NGOs and uh, how th this professionalization uh, mixed with the internationalization would affect their claims and their repertoires. And I conducted a year-long field work in different NGOs, all in Paris, all invested in the field of health, and all with international co connections. As it happens, they were also specifically oriented, one way or another, towards AIDS prevention. So I did some research. I conducted participant observation. Uh, this led me to endorse, as you, might, as you might know, the role of the people I was studying. So for a year, I wrote press releases. I translated text. I drafted reports. I computed data for people. Um, I was working in one of them and the organization I'm going to take as an example today uh, as, a, as a deputy for an advocacy officer. Um, and one day after doing all this, I found myself at a G8 summit. So as you know, the G8 summit is this um, yearly moment when the leaders of the uh, eight um, richest countries of the planet uh, are um, gather for a few days to evoke the situation of the world. And um, this talk basically is going to be organized around this four-day episode um, because for many of the important traits I witnessed during the year-long research were, con the research were condensed uh, uh, and somehow amplified during this field trip. I'm using the ex this experience as a way to uh, unpack uh, the results from the longer, broader research. Uh, but before we, we jump into like these, uh, these questions, I'd like to start with a quick anecdote, which is going to set the stage for us and to foreshadow some of the questions we'll be, uh, we'll be, tackling, on late, we'll be tackling later on. So as I mentioned earlier, I had been working as a deputy for an advocacy officer, Axel. So this is Axel. He's, um, in his, he was in his early 30s. He had been uh, an advocacy officer in this organization for probably five or six years. And one day, uh, as we were g getting off a meeting, he asked me if I would be interested in going to the next G8 summit with him. 
Although I had absolutely no clue uh, what we would be doing there, uh, I accepted. We were good friends, actually. And, um, but I didn't get to know much more uh, before our arrival in Germany. Axel is busy, and he didn't take much time to tell me what we were about to do. The only thing he told me is that we would go there to do some lobbying. Uh, and for this, he would need me to be registered, just like him, as a journalist in order to get into the media center. So he took care of that for me, and two weeks before our departure, um, I received an email announcing that I had been granted a press accreditation. So here we are in Germany. It's June. It's 8 in the morning. Uh, we arrived at a hotel a few days before. We met with uh, colleagues of Axel uh, who are staying with us. So I'm going to introduce you to, uh, to these people. So you have uh, on the right, you have Stefan. Uh, he's uh, Axel's counterpart for a, a British network of NGOs all working on AIDS. At the bottom, you got, uh, bottom left, you got Steffi. She used to be an advocacy officer in Germany. She's now working uh, as an assistant in, a, in an international institution uh, promoting health. And on the bottom right, you got Mary. She's a Nigerian doctor, and uh, she sits on the board of a national AIDS program in her country. So we are driving, actually, I am driving a small rental car, a compact three-door, which is uh, filled to capacity. And so we are driving on the roads of, uh, the, small, of, of the small roads of the German countryside uh, next to the Baltic coast. Uh, and what we, are, um, what we are witnessing are uh, this scene, more or less. Uh, we are going slowly because, as you can see on both sides of the road, you got hundreds of protesters walking. Most of them are heading toward the red zone. And in many makeshift camps, which flourished the previous night, people are getting ready to... Um, to go. Sometimes they walk in front of flocks of policemen or army uh, security forces, militaries, all of them in riot gears. Um, and surprisingly enough, everything happens in a very laid-back atmosphere, uh, whereas both parties know very well that within a few hours of time, uh, they will probably engage in a violent hide-and-seek game uh, in, uh, in the cornfields. Okay. Where are we trying to go? Well, before that, where aren't, where aren't we trying to go? So we left the hotel in the morning, uh, which was in Rostock, this industrial city in, uh, in the north of Germany. We're not trying to go to Heiligen Dam, where uh, the summit is being held. Uh, so what you can see in uh, dark here is the massive fence that has been created by uh, the organizer, that has been set up by the organizers, in order to uh, prevent the protesters who are themselves trying to arrive all around the zone in order to derail the meeting. But we're not trying to go there, neither inside nor outside. We're trying to go here, in Kulungsborn. Um, Kulungsborn is actually the place in which the International Media Center, set up to host more than 3,000, 4,000 journalists, is uh, located. And so we're going there, uh, we're trying to go there, but it's not so easy because uh, some roads have been blocked for security reasons, um, those uh, close to the red zone, and the others are filled with pro protesters. And even more, protesters are uh, progressively starting to set up blockade uh, on the roads by sitting in the middle of the street. So every time this happens, uh, they are quickly surrounded by a squad of, pol a squad of policemen, and uh, in turn, they block the road and they reroute the car. And this actually happened to us several times. Uh, the more we are approaching the zone, actually, and the harder it gets to, uh, to, um, to, 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 to get into, to, the harder it gets. So we are often take, uh, told to uh, choose an alternative road. When we met in the morning, everyone was a little bit edgy, you know, stressed out, like, are we going to get in? Are we, ma we going to manage to sneak in, the, um, to sneak in the, uh, the, 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 the summit? But now the tension is clearly rising because we, did, we are not even managing to approach the International Media Center. Um, it's now past 9.30. Uh, blockades are spreading, and uh, we know that if we don't arrive to a Kulungsborn pretty soon, all the roads are going to be blocked. So uh, Axel, sitting on the passenger seat, is clearly getting agitated. Steffi, on her part, is uh, uh, placing phone calls, saying that we're experiencing delays. But with the help of Stefan uh, reading the map, uh, we managed to find a small road, which is not featured here, but which arrived to Kulungsborn on the west. And we haven't seen any protesters in a while, um, just a few of them walking on the shoulder of the street. The city is inside, probably five miles, and um, the road seems to be clear of any obstacle. There are just some teenagers riding the bike, um, so we all assume that we'll be there soon. 
But obviously, as soon as um, as soon as we uh, as soon as the nadi says, the bike riders stop to a halt and uh, form a loose pack in the middle of the street, progressively um, slowing. Um, so 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 I have to stop the car, and I stop the car probably a hundred yards from them. Um, Axel, trying to remain calm, literally rushes over to them and uh, to get them to let us pass. So he tries to talk them into um, into let it, letting us go, and I can't hear everything that he says, but um, basically I overhear a few words. Look, he says, we're activists. We are on the same side. We are trying to pressure the decision makers. Hmm. Being into the summit and at the same time being a fierce opponent to it is something that must have sounded quite questionable to them because within a few minutes he comes back and he's defeated. So the situation now is pretty desperate because we are facing a pack of riders. That's the last road that we could actually go through. And um, they're sitting in the road. The three people in the back seat are very, are very stressed out. So what does actually Axel do? Well, he leans toward me and says to me in French, so far we had been speaking in English, um, Etienne, do you see the road that um, 20 yards ahead of us that cuts on the right uh, in the field? Uh, I nod. Do you think you could, uh, you could drive on that? Um, well, um, I'm confused, you know, um, you mean across the fields? Um, well, fast and assertive, you know, like he's like, oh yes, look, there is a parallel road to this one just a few hundred yards over there. So um, if you manage to reach it, you know, since the blockade is located further up on that road, well, then we'll be at, we'll arrive at Kolungsborn without problem. And I'm like, well, but, but, but you know, it's been raining all night um, and it depends on the soil and we might get stuck. And um, well, it's now or never, he says, you know, because as two of the protesters are mo trying to move uh, toward us in our direction, um, probably thinking the same. Go, go, but uh, go. And I'm like, oh, okay. So before you know it, you know, I release a parking brake, I throw the stick in first gear, and I'm, a tr I'm, on, a, I'm on the tractor field path. <laughs> huh. So to be honest, I don't know what the other passengers thought about it. Uh, but I can tell you that in my, rear, in my rear mirror, I have a flock of infuriated cyclists, you know, who are actually trying to get at us. Um, feeling like a scab, hoping that we won't get flat or break anything, I sped up. And as predicted by Excel, within a few minutes, we reach the International Media Center. All right, so in addition to setting the stage, uh, this prologue introduces us to a few ideas that you might want to uh, keep in mind while we'll be, um, we'll be uh, going through this presentation. The first one is that you have unexpected actors trying and actually managing to get into the summit. The second one, the second one is that these unexpected actors are actually going uh, in a place which is also unexpected, because they're also, where are they trying to go? They're trying to see the journalists. And finally, what you might want to keep in mind is that the line between opponents and participants is blurred by the presence, as shown you know, by the, uh, um, I would say, um, some surprise expressed by the demonstrators when Axel tried to, uh, to tell them that we are going to, uh, that we are on the same side. Okay? So, um, there is actually an unnoticed irony in the contemporary approach to uh, international summits, because in spite of their intense media coverage, um, we know very little about the very organization and about the unfolding of these events. Held in highly secluded spaces, mostly made up of private meeting, their functioning and the decision-making process remains largely opaque. Consequently, it's commonly assumed by those studying the proceedings uh, of these summits that all that needs to be known either lies on in the final statement written by the aides to the heads of state who are secluded in the red zone, or in the massive protest, on the other hand, that are uh, taking place around the premises. Um, the literature the literature on the topic tends to confirm this rift. Um, on the one hand, the students of social movement have extensively documented the recent transformations and continuities in the uh, anti-neoliberal globalization movement. Um, social movement scholars have largely investigated the protesters' varying claims and techniques, uh, scrutinized the formation, solidification, and uh, withering away of the coalitions. They also have paid a good deal of attention to the historical emergence of uh, the anti-globalization movement. And finally, uh, they have studied in depth more recently the counter summits that they have created. So that's for outside. On the other hand, uh, an important literature describes the leaders within the summits. Um, 
they analyze the consequences of their decisions in terms of world governance. And uh, they try to assess the impact of these rallies um, year after year. But very few scholars actually have emphasized the various and important connections that exist between these two words. The summits and the reaction they entail are all too often depicted uh, as symmetrically opposed and mutually exclusive one from another. In other words, everything happens as if the massive fence set up by the organizers to keep both worlds apart had been imported in the social scientific literature. Four days spent at the International Media Center of a 2007 G8 summit challenged this rigid vision and cast a different light on the very production of these uh, events. In fact, of all the organizations present at the G8 counter summit, set up a few kilometers away from the red zone, um, a lot of groups were also represented within the official summits. Because alongside the thousands of journalists brought together in the gigantic international media center, one could find hundreds and hundreds of spokespersons, advocacy officers, and even public relations officers. All were constantly operating in a quite conspicuous way in the premises of a, on the premises of a center. And although impossible to quantify precisely, some advocacy officer told me that maybe 20% uh, of the journalists, right, people registered as journalists were fake journalists. But I think it's impossible to quantify. I mean, I, at least I could not. What I could see, actually, is that there were scores of people working on behalf of an NGO or for an international organization uh, day after day during the summit in the media center. And for several reasons, only one of which was the limited access to the negotiators who were actually five kilometers away in the red zone. Uh, most of the activities of these numerous advocacy officers is actually oriented toward the media. And if the people in charge of negotiating and, the, and drafting the final report um, are clearly the main target of these unsuspected political communicants, all the NGOs here are pursuing the same strategies. Registered as journalists, they nonetheless dedicate most of the time to try to influence the journalists. Invisible to the public in this otherwise highly scrutinized context, their actions are also quite absent from the literature uh, in social science. And in the wake of some rare existing accounts on the topic, this presentation invites us to fill this gap. By doing so, it raises two questions. First of all, showing in details um, the craft of the advocacy officer, whose activity is primarily oriented toward the journalist during major summits. This presentation highlights the different strategies deployed by these unexpected lobbyists to garner public attention. It shows the various use they make of the media, and consequently it draws our attention onto a specific and unexpected type of lobbying, which puts the media at the center of the strategies of the NGOs. But while concretely describing some overlooked factors uh, in the production of the news at uh, international summits, the presentation invites to go further and examines the practical and theoretical consequences of this massive presence of advocacy officer at international summits. For they are essential to the works of a journalist during the summits, the NGOs are also integral to the summits they criticize and sometimes denounce. And just as these groups cannot be described as exterior to the process of newsmaking, it must be acknowledged that the social movements that they are part of have become integral to the making of the summits too. In short, the findings invites us to blur the rigid boundary that exists between social movements and the institutions they sometimes oppose of. Okay, so that's uh, the outline of the talk, and let's jump into the first, uh, the first part. Um, so this is, a, this is a one ale uh, of the International Media Center, and a fact beyond imagination for many an opponent, and actually for many people, is that scores of NGO envoys are getting busy on the premises. And you know, some are very open about their affiliation. Uh, on these tables, normally reserved for journalists, uh, I, uh, when I first walked in, I saw a dozen of a very famous international organization opposing of globalization. And not only could I recognize them because I was told that it was them, but they also were wearing, all of them, the orange shirt with a huge logo emblazoned on it. So it was pretty conspicuous. Um, in many respects, um, the center resembled uh, the souk, um, the souk described by the anthropologist Clifford Geertz. While the journalists always looking for material to execute their work, 
uh, are or were similar to the buyers to the buyers of the Moroccan market. The swarms of advocacy officers resembled for the part the numerous sellers competing for the attention of the former. And like in the bazaar, concealed agonistic relations were taking place between journalists and advocacy officers, just as between advocacy officers themselves. And in spite of the interpersonal character of a transaction, which tends to conceal this fact, the ends remain the same for every participant, making a deal. More than a place set aside where people are permitted to come each day to deceive one another, wrote Geert, the bazaar is a stage onto which actors, coordinated by a set of strictly defined rules and norms, meet periodically to, for a mutual benefit. But no matter how much needed this cooperation is, it must not be forgotten that in Morocco, just as in Kulungsborn, everyone is here to collectively achieve individual goals. Um, and this is sometimes made by pressuring the journalist or at the expense of other groups. The complex relation between journalists and advocacy officers give way to actually two types of pressure, two main types of pressure. The main one is carried out by advocacy officers on the newsmakers. Trying to disseminate their uh, claims and to have their point of view represented in the media, most of the activities of the NGO members present on the premises consist in handing information and in making themselves available for interviews. But this does not go without tensions, and no matter how much journalists uh, are interested in advocacy officers and in the stories, the latter could be an impediment to the realization of their work. I quickly got to realize this fact after I found myself rebuffed, you know, for uh, several times. Let's, um, let's consider this quote. So this is from my field notes on the first day of the summit. I typed them up uh, coming back uh, on the first evening. I was asked by Axel to go downstairs where the private rooms for the TVs are located. Door after door, I tried to establish contacts offered some information and mentioned that we were all available for any comment, or better, for an interview. Cut. Well, it did not work. In the best of cases, someone listened to my sales speech, took politely the primer I had worked on before, and um, he, he or she said that they would give us a call. But most of the time, I did not even manage to catch someone's attention. Cut. After several failed attempts, actually more than an hour, uh, I went back to our temporary headquarters upstairs. Vexed and quite weary, I bumped into Steffi. As I proceeded to tell her about my misfortune, she confronted me. At the G8, it's often like this, you know. First, the journalists take your flyer and even discuss with you, but then they become very annoyed um, because they have 20 people offering an interview. Although never mentioned explicitly nor even talked about, there is a clear competition between NGOs for accessing the journalists. Um, but this is clearly not the sole type of pressure going on, as a self-enforced regulation also happens among the groups purportedly sharing the same principled ideas, the group purportedly belonging to the same epistemic communities. At noon on the first day, a woman from a large um, British multi-purpose NGO stopped at the table and uh, assuming that we were, uh, we were journalists, but after all, how could she have known? You know, we had like the badges with a yellow lace necklace. Um, she launched into what sounded like a routine sales pitch about education and health in, um, in developing countries. Well, it did not take long be before uh, someone, you know, told her that uh, we were um, cordially that indicated to her that we were two NGOs. And she smiled and left for another table, the next one actually, uh, not without giving us some of the uh, leaflets she was generously handing out. Um, Axel took it, skimmed through it, and uh, passed it on to Steffi. And he asked her what she thought about the paragraph on aid. Before she could say anything, he continued, well, I, I think the tone is uh, way too cautious and that the claims are really too limited. Steffi nodded, and shortly after, Axel was heading toward the table um, to ask them to change this line in the literature. His endeavor proved very successful. In the following flyer, released later in the afternoon, the paragraph on AIDS had been modified and the demands had risen. What this shows, what these two examples about the pressure show, is that in spite of all the current talk about the advent of global civil society, this metaphorical sphere encompassing all non-state nor market actors uh, acting together for the betterment of humanity, the media center had clearly more to do with a competitive arena than with a space where uh, particular interests have been superseded. And if the pressure was always friendly and, conce and concealed behind the rhetoric of general interest, it was not less present nor less effective. 
Okay, it sometimes takes, as I, as I would notice there, a good deal of contextual information to understand just a word. Take this exchange between Axel and Steffi on the evening of her arrival. Steffi, I went to the media center today, uh, that was before we arrived. I think that it will be easy for us to get in. Axel, good. Steffi, but it seems that many groups came with a black person. Axel, expletive. <laughs> in this case, it is not until I spent a day in the center that I fully got to understand Axel's very explicit uh, disappointment. Um, and also Mary's role in our strategy. At first, I did not pay much attention to her. A doctor, she was a member of a national AIDS program in her, uh, in her country, and I could see many more reasons for her to be here than for me. Um, but, you know, it's not before we were well into the first day of work that I actually realized the rationale for her presence. Mary was not so much another advocacy officer working on AIDS as she was our asset the main tool to publicize our claims. Her stay at the media center had been arranged by Steffi, whose organization had paid for the trip, and clearly she was way more successful at getting interviews than any of us was. Or rather, she made it easier for us to get interviews for her. Media attention grew sharply with our ability to provide first-hand experience accounts on our subject, and nothing proved more useful in terms of communication than to foreground the presence of victims or of witnesses. Eager to gather some reaction and images of those directly affected by the decisions of a G8, the journalist would sometimes switch from rejection if approached with a general theme. Um, excuse me, do you have a second to uh, discuss uh, AIDS in the world and uh, the role of G8 uh, regarding that? don't work, to ostensible interest uh, when talked into the possibility of an interview with a representative of civil society. Um, excuse me, um, Dr. Mary, uh, Dr. X, Mary is from Nigeria. She works with the National AIDS Program there, and uh, she's a mother of three, and she's also HIV positive. Works. Um, a large part of the activity of the advocacy officer is then to cater during these moments, ready to use, and as much as possible, graphic account to the press. Working under strict time constraints, journalists often find it convenient to rely on, those, on these readily available sources during the summit. And while they're more interested in receiving this material when the interviews uh, are um, offer, that are often match the hot topics of, of the moment, that year it was obviously global warming, I think this year probably the economy is going to be um, quite the topic. Um, a minor issue with regards to the priority of the moment can perfectly be broadcast as a second best if nothing better comes up, you know, before, uh, before it's time to be live. Capital, skills, and industriousness play, as, along with luck and privilege, as important a role in the bazaar as they do in the economic system, wrote Geertz again. The same holds true for the interactions taking place in the media center. Not all advocacy officers arrive equal at the summit. Beside the obvious advantage given to those working on an issue that is in the limelight of the moment, um, many factors account for, uh, for the success of a communicant. For radio or TV, obviously, the ability to uh, adapt oneself to the format is obviously crucial. But this is only one necessary condition, uh, one yeah, necessary condition that builds on other already existing properties that made the very interview possible. Among these, a long time involvement with a topic is a clear advantage. This is not so much true because journalists would only speak to experienced activists rather than due to the fact that they got to know each other. And these repeated interactions over time offer another advantage because in Cullingsbourne, like in Morocco, whether we are talking about consumable good or a piece of news, information about the, price, the product is scarce and um, the reputation of a trade partner is central to the transaction. Both the density of the networks, which allow information to, fo to flow quickly and without not too much distortion, and the identity of the people of the partners matter. Um, clientelization, as Geertz had it, works as a way to reduce the amount of information that journalists need to manage in order to carry out their work efficiently. And most of the interviews that Axel got were with people he knew or when he had been recommended by a colleague to a journalist. All right, so this leads us to characterize the strategies of the NGOs. After, after the second day of the summit, uh, as we were driving back to the hotel, and it would sometimes take some time, you know, um, 
I asked Axel and, Sa and Stefan uh, a question I had been mulling over all day. What is our real goal? Because in my mind, the main point of our trip to the summit was to put the pressure on the decision on the G8 leaders so that the paragraph on AIDS would be modified uh, according to what we were actually trying to, uh, to promote. Um, but not only hadn't we met any of them, but we had not even managed to reach any of their assistants, and neither of my companions seemed to care much about it. It's not that they weren't concerned about the outcome. To the contrary, both kept asking, and that's really a real game during these summits, both kept, kept asking everyone they would meet about the final stat statement, wondering if their paragraph was already written in process, potentially modifiable. The common question actually was, that, was, was is there an update? And both had repeatedly tried to call the country's official either at the Elysee, the French presidential palace, or at the 10 Downing Street. But uh, as I would discover, they were actually, um, just like many others, pursuing an indirect strategy. By taking advantage of the intense coverage of a summit, those working on behalf of NGOs were clearly oriented toward the media, which they tried to use for their own profit. Acknowledging the structural weakness due to the limited access to the deciders, most of them were trying to pressure the decision makers by forcing their topic into the news. So as we can see, they use the media first as a sounding board. Uh, I'm going to be quick on this point because we talked, uh, and you have a sense about that, you know, like the networks and the press agencies are used uh, as a way to publicize the claims of the networks, of the uh, NGOs, and as a mechanism for echoing and amplifying their demands so as to render them necessary stakes in the public debate. I'd rather like to focus on a less evident point. Um, NGOs use the media as a recording device to, as an instrument to make the leaders accountable, and it takes some work to make, this ha to make this happen, as shown in this example. So every day, what would happen is that in the evening, we would leave the press center and head toward the red zone, within the press zone, within the red zone, toward the press briefing center, where the heads of states were giving a quick press briefing in the evening. Ideally, as Axel would have liked to, we would ask uh, a question to the president in this highly scrutinized moment. But being known as an advocacy officer, Axel knew that there was no chance whatsoever that um, he, how, and no matter how hard he would try, he would never be handed the microphone during the press conference. But he thought, he thought I could. Uh, and as predicted by him, you know, after I uh, actually talked to the press team, uh, talked talk to the uh, the, uh, the assistance to uh, the, press, uh, the press secretary of the French uh, presidential palace, I managed to grab a microphone uh, during the last press conference. And uh, when 200 people had crammed into the room to see the newly elected president, so I stood up and I asked the question uh, that Axel had written down for me earlier. At the end of a, of, of, of a press conference, uh, Axel joined me because as much as possible we tried, you know, we, we tried avoiding being seen together. Um, and so this is the exchange. So, did you ask a question? So here I, um, I, uh, I, I, I ask him that why, why he wasn't here and he was actually at another press briefing trying to ask a question at another leader. And so, um, did you ask a question? He was actually joking, you know, he didn't think I could make it. Um, well, yes, I did. Oh, congratulations, why did he answer? Nah, well, it was most, mostly a non-answer. He didn't say why, they did not achieve any precise funding plan. And uh, he criticized me for saying that the summit was a failure in terms of global health. He even mentioned some figures I didn't quite get and switched to the next question. Expletive. Oh, and he also said something about pledging one billion a year for health in Africa. Have you ever heard of that? Excel, no. Um, he must have come up with it just then. But it was not in the discussions, at least not that I know of. The billion offered by the French president to improve health in Africa was probably one of his numerous slips, and Axel knew it very well. It had never been evoked before, not even a few days ago before, when several NGOs had met with the president in person to discuss the topic. But this did not prevent Axel from asking every single journalist he would meet on the way back on the train that was bringing us back to the press center if they had taken note of this surprisingly good news. Um, he was clearly here trying to solidify what was nothing but a word and was trying to have it validated, ratified by the media. 
Commenting on this point later, he explained to me that part of the activity was to force public statement in front of a journalist and that this played a key role in making the leaders accountable for their words. Several months later, in the many press releases he would write, Axel would still remind the president of his German promise. So as illustrated above, the special, a special type of lobbying goes on during these international meetings, and especially during the G8, which is probably a little bit more NGO-friendly. It consists in an indirect, mediated pressure exerted by the media and through the media. Whether they try to cater information, stories, images, or expertise also, that's very important, to the journalists present, or attempt to, first, to force public statements in front of a press center, in front of the press, NGOs make the media central to the strategy. Okay, let's now turn to the last point of this presentation. Um, the previous finding invites us to revisit both our understanding of um, the way information is produced and of uh, the role of the NGOs in the process of globalization. First of all, let's uh, remind quickly that commonsensical visions of journalism tend to depict newsmaking in two opposite ways. Journalists are either depicted as the ultimate defenders of an assaulted truth with like swarms of interest groups trying to push their agenda surrounding them and them, the white knights of information defending them. Or on the other hand, they are uh, mere tools in the hand of a manipulative elite. Without denying that information professionals are exposed to pressures, threats, and protest and a tremendous numbers of remarks that can potentially have a chilling effect, uh, and I can tell you that I witnessed a few of these, uh, both approaches might not be the most fruitful way to approach um, the way um, information is produced uh, within the International Media Center and to look at these interactions. Not only don't they do justice to the very way the news professionals experience these uh, encounters, but it conceals the fact that they often seek these interactions, which are regarded as part of a job. The media strategies of the NGOs are actually never more efficient than when those who try to influence the journalists are actually very close to them and available for them at the right moment. Being present on site confers a clear advantage to those who try to influence the media. Not only can they disseminate their view and engage with journalists in various situations, but in addition to that, um, they are uh, also able to offer interviews, quotes, images, or other kinds of uh, rare primary material that journalists are often eager to procure. But there is actually more to that, and uh, the role in the making of the news at a moment when information and communication, 5,000 journalists, is extremely important, invite us to reflect on the role of the NGOs with respect to these uh, institutions of globalization and to the world governance. The increased presence and influence of NGOs at the international level has been largely evoked. Noting the growing influence of uh, non-state actors at the international levels, many scholars saw in, um, in it a radical change in world politics. Describing the, fun the functioning of some transnational networks, these scholars showed they promoted transparency in many international institutions and initiated a reflection on norm setting at the international level. Most of them equipped with the concept and the general framework of uh, international relation constructivist theory. Um, these scholars, these students of global activism, were keen to report the growing visibility and the growing impact of this representative of civil society, purportedly breathing ideals and norms in the icy darkness of international politics. Focusing on non-state actors as source of resistance to uh, from below to globalization from above, most of the authors paid a special attention to the consequences of a movement on democracy at the world level. Actually, making explicit what remains an untold hypothesis in most of his work, um, social movement specialist Jackie Smith claimed that the current movements are acting on behalf of a global democratic network. Uh, and together are competing against another coalition, the neoliberal network. Well, no matter, no matter how insightful and uh, 
like interesting this uh, symmetrical approach to globalization networks can be. It does not describe accurately either the position assumed by certain social movements present on the premises of a media center. And less than a clear cut opposition between the global democracy activist and the nemesis, the action of the advocacy officer can at best be described as ambiguous with respect to the summit. Whether the selection of the NGOs was made by German officials who officially invaded a few institutionalized ones to uh, follow the proceedings from within the press center, or whether the choice was made by the organizations themselves, only a few of them knew how to come and even fewer knew, uh, were accepting to do that. The main interlocutors of a journalist all pertained to a special type of social movement, one that does not radically and call into question uh, the G8 summits. The specificity of his interview is clearly emphasize the voice of those who criticized the G8 summit, but only within its own terms, and did not call into question, or at least not in the press releases, the existence of the G8 itself. Having started five days ago, uh, five days before the official summit, the organization pre present on the premises had a chance to get some media coverage. But since people were offering raw material on the premises, and because opponents were distant, um, 30 kilometers away, blockades, um, fence, uh, this, there was clearly no incentive for the journalists to seek elsewhere what they had at hand. And most of the information actually was produced from within the summit. So don't get me wrong. Uh, I'm not saying that the groups present at the G8 were purely co-opted. Neither am I saying that they all approved of the existence of such an institution, and even less that they approved of its decisions. But for one thing, the sheer presence is an implicit support given uh, to the international division of power. And even more, by virtue of their active participation, they also significantly increased the visibility and most likely the legitimacy of a G8, whose leader really need to display massive public support and interest in civil society in the face of the oppositions they've been confronted to in the last 10 years. It might be said that this it might be that this is the best solution for NGOs uh, in the face of the oppositions that they are confronted to, um, and also in order to promote their claims. And these remarks should by no means be seen as, be seen as a criticism of those engaged in these activities. Nonetheless, the previous findings call for a critical examination of the oft evoked distinction between social movement on the one hand and the institution favoring globalization from above they oppose of. For some of them, and in particular the transnational advocacy networks um, hailed by many as the cornerstone of a new possible world order have increasingly, increasingly been playing an active role in, um, in the global governance that emerged in the last 20 years. They cannot be any longer um, be considered as outsiders to it. Called, by, called for by the leaders of, um, of the G8 in a final statement of the 2000 meeting, the broader involvement of civil society has indisputably happened in certain areas. And NGOs have, for the, mo for the most internationalized of them, um, become crucial agents of globalization, blurring the boundaries between uh, outsiders and insiders of a system, producing reports and expertise that is used by these international institutions, and which circulates and cuts across the classical distinction between state and non-state actors. They are double agents whose position in the system cannot be ascribed, cannot be ascribed univocally anymore. Okay, let me conclude very quickly before we open the floor to uh, questions. I would like to um, first have a word on the method. I used this field work uh, conducted at the G8 as a way to unpack some of the results gathered during the year-long research I conducted. And by doing this, I'm using this four-day episode as a magnified image, as a prism through which some features are made more visible. By choosing this mode of exposition, I am not saying that I captured all the interactions going during the summit, nor that I got a full picture of how the news are made. Rather, this method is useful to emphasize some overlooked traits of the work of the advocacy officer I was I was studying. And this method offers two interesting insights. First, um, in their seminal work on transnational activist network, as I, that I've been mentioning before, Margaret Keck and Catherine Seeking showed that information politics have become a central element in the repertoire of social movements. The G8 is uh, then a case in point to confirm, but also to specify this. For it shows the conditions of efficiency of such a technique. And even more, because it details the way some NGOs use the media, it demonstrates that a mediated pressure can be imposed onto journalists by unexpected lobbyists. 
This result and the role of some social movements in the making of information leads us to the second point. 20 years ago, media studies and the sociology of journalism have done away with the myth of a rigid boundary between the journalists on the one hand and their sources. No, now has come the time to realize the same shift when it comes to social movements and to globalization. A consequence of the increased presence of social movements in the institutions of globalization that they allegedly oppose of is that we can no longer um, regard them as exterior to the process of globalization. To the contrary, we need to consider the role they play in the very production of the event they criticize and at the same time influence from within. Thank you. All right. Are there any questions? Please. Uh, this weekend is a big summit. Indeed. <laughs> this weekend is a big summit. It'll be very interesting to see how your comments uh, are portrayed this weekend. I understand there will be 20 or 30,000 protesters in, there, mm -hmm. in Strasbourg, and there are thousands of police, German and French, are going to be there. And what kind of news coverage there will be, especially like this? Right. No, that's totally true. Actually, um, G8, G20, G no matter how many you want, you know, uh, meet regularly. Uh, they, uh, they actually meet uh, several times during the year uh, to prepare the G8 summit. Uh, what, was, what is specific to a G8 summit, specific to the G8, but also to the WTO, to the IMF, to the World Bank, is that uh, when they meet for these big meetings, an international media center is set up. Actually, uh, the, the international media center you saw was created from scratch. It cost a fortune to do something like this. Um, and this is not going to happen in the in the next few days. I mean, there's going to be there, there's going to be a little a, a smaller media center. And from what I know, I don't know any organization going there. Although I guess that some are going, you know. But it's not going to be as big as you know what happens here. Uh, although, yeah, one can probably uh, think that there's going to be some lobbying going there, going on there. Anyone else? I'm interested in your recommendations about what is the role of, of NGOs, and I wonder if, mm -hmm. if part of coming up with that role on a global stage has to do with classification. I know, I know that in the UN system, the United Nations um, Department of Public Information has over 30 different categories for NGOs, and mm -hmm. they, they try to classify them. And, and, and having not, be, not been very familiar with the G8, I wonder if there is an effort to separate out, first of all, protesters from lobbyists. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, I wonder if the term lobbying, which I, I think some at the, in the NGO community find a little distasteful, uh -huh. is, is uh, certainly part of the literature. But I wonder if, if the academic literature reflects sort of the, the sentiment or the, the reality of, of, of how this works at these international fora. Right. So that's a great question. Actually, uh, again, one of the one specificity of uh, of a G8 is that there are no lobbyists accepted normally. So, and there are, this is the case in other institutions. That's the case in Brussels. I was in studying in in, um, in Brussels for a month, you know, and you have really registered lobbyists going there. So this is uh, this is something that is very much institutionalized. At the G8, that's not the case. So if you want to be doing some lobby, you have to sneak in as a fake journalist. Now, why did I choose the world? Uh, the world, the world uh, lobbyist. Well, my main point is that I had nothing better to uh, describe what's going on, and I also wanted to be a little bit provocative. That is to say, try to have us think of what it means to have these people who are actually putting the pressure either on the decision makers or even more on the journalists. Are they doing what we would refer as advocacy officer? Um, yes. Are they doing what we generally describe as NGO work? Well, maybe a little bit less. So my idea here is that no matter how, like, distateful it can be, uh, we need to think of like the NGOs as having a certain power and that the, they are actually trying to promote their agenda as consulting firm, firms are trying to, um, to, uh, to, um, to promote their agenda. I totally do agree that um, they are motivated by different, they have different rationale, um, that uh, I'm not calling into question their motivation, you know. But it's just that if we want to approach that uh, from, a, say, a more scientific point of view, we need to be symmetrical and to actually study these techniques, you know, just as they are. On the ground, I couldn't make any distinction between PR people who are hired, you know, by a firm, who, who are from a firm hired by an international institution and the advocacy officer, maybe you know, like the network, but that's the only, uh, that's the only difference. 
So actually, that's, yeah, the, the, the question of the term is a good one. Um, I think I use it mostly to uh, blur a little bit the boundary between like the third sector, you know, and the market, and to blur a little bit the rosy picture about NGOs being all about IDs, norms, you know. So I'm actually trying to like go against like the main chunk in the, the main part of the literature, which is describing NGO as you know very uh, like promoting ideals and world governance <coughs> and being exterior to um, to that to, to the decision making process. I have a couple questions. Sure. Uh, the first one has to do with the billion dollars that Sarkozy promised. Mm -hmm. Did the French ever come up with it? Mm-hmm. The second question is, um, in other words, did he follow through with this? Was he pressured enough by the media, this mediated pressure, to actually have to account for it and to, and to show it somewhere and to, and to, to give it to, to Africa? The second one is, and we're looking at this image here of Mary, I think, is at the BBC mm -hmm. interview. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I want to know if this particular NGO has a long-term relationship with this doctor or if this is common to bring in these outsiders almost as like a modernized form of colonial exploitation. Um, and secondly, what your relationship with Axel has been af uh, in the wake of the, the, the conclusion of your research, uh, this field work, whether um, you stay in contact, whether he's aware of some of your publication <laughs> or uh, is these talks that you're giving where you talk about this experience that you have. Those are my two questions. Thanks. All right. Well, two great questions. Um, on the billion dollar, so that's a tricky question. Um, it has been published a little bit in the press, but most importantly, it's been published um, on the website of the French Presidential Palace as the official transcript. So if you want to check, you can go online. I can give you the URL address, and uh, the billion is actually written down. So actually, Axel uses that because it's even better. You know, it's like it's the world of uh, the world of truth because it's Sarkozy you just quoted. So um, so that's uh, that's what he uses, and that's what he quotes when the references when he wants to um, to recall the president, remind the president of his promise. Um, it hasn't obviously gone through because I think France was dedicating 300 million to uh, health in Africa yearly. Um, so that would be more than triple uh, at a moment when France was trying to cut his spending, you know, a lot. But I have to say that I think Excel has been quite successful and that there's been an increase, which is quite rare because at that very moment, um, all, the, all the expenses, all the French budget, was go all the expenses in the budget were going down. So actually the fact that this line is going up might be something that, uh, but you know, it's always very hard to know if that's, if you are the one who made the decision. I know that he did a lot of follow-up work and the follow-up work is basically calling, you know, the aides to like the treasury, treasury secretary or to the foreign affairs ministers and asking them how to implement that actually. So that's for the, uh, the billion question. Um, Regarding the ethics of a researcher and the question of a publication, which is a very good one, yeah, Axel knows about it. Um, he's um, he turned into I wouldn't say a good friend because we don't see each other anymore because I left for the U.S. right after. But um, he's someone I'm still in touch and I still do uh, see every time I go back to France. Uh, he actually received the article, so he knows that uh, I'm um, I'm uh, I'm talking about that. He uh, didn't say anything, but I obviously changed all the names. Um, I obviously change the countries, so there is a you know the minimal anonymity anonym that is uh, that is respected here, and I don't think that he bothers so much because this is something that is you know like outside of his uh, like he's doing something else and he's really you know like focusing on that. That's a question I've been asking to myself a lot. Like, am I going to undermine their access to the G8? Am I going to uh, to undermine their mode of action, which I you know mostly approve um, personally? Um, in certain respects, not everything, but in certain respects. So, am I going to uh, to undermine him? And he told me he told me that I could go with it. So, I guess that actually it's okay. But uh, there is always a tension, especially. But that's true for every you know social scientific type of research. When you start to um, become acquainted, or even friend with the people, well, you end up uh, you end up sometimes being a little bit you know at odds with them when you publish because you might not write everything that you are that they would like to see you know so that's uh, that's always a problem Mary? Uh, oh mary sorry yeah and, and the, uh, more as a physician is she a person you had a long-term relationship with or is she a, a place marker a place holder? mary my um 
silence here was not because I was embarrassed, but more because I'm not sure. So I'm going to be cautious about what I say. I think, for what I know, that she's been involved with, uh, as I told you, with the national AIDS program in her country. And as a consequence, this is uh, how she got involved with Axel and with you know, other people. So I think that she's very happy to do that. But it's really true that uh, I was surprised by you know, what she was doing. She was actually you know, wearing this uh, like, um, traditional dress. Uh, she was really the token you know, that we were actually bringing. So it's thought of as you know, a way of like, pressuring the government. It's thought of as a way to improving health in Africa or in her country. So everyone thinks of that as a win-win situation. Uh, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have some you know, taste of, uh, like, as you said, colonial, uh, colonial exploitation or... Uh, or clearly, we were we were using her, you know, with her um, with her uh, agreement. But that's uh, that's how it was. Anyone else? Yes? No? Okay. Shall we close? Well, thanks a lot. Um, thanks a lot for coming. <laughs>